four we have met here today. Uh, we have asked our participants and our panelists what they think about cooperation in the big pharma. So uh, for those who doesn't know uh, what would be the topic, the topic is to combine, collect and show us how we can cooperate together uh, with big pharma. So right now, uh, I see that we have people from mostly academia, some from startups and some from pharma. So I believe that it could be interesting results for all of us because the questions that we have presented were uh, the answers that we have uh, collected are saying us that the cooperation with big pharma is quite good because uh, when I asked our panelists how do you score cooperation with Big Pharma, they, they said to me that this is quite good because four on five stars they have given. Maybe some of our panelists would like to uh, comment that. Why this cooperation is so good? Maybe Mikolai? Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't remember exactly my answer. I think I was a little bit more, let's say, somewhere in the middle. Because uh, I would say answering your question, it really depends uh, how would you basically evaluate. So basically, what is the, what is the entry point of that collaboration? For instance, if, you, if this is collaboration between startup and the pharma, or whether this is collaboration between, let's say, clinical center research team at the university or academia. So I would say it really depends, uh, at least uh, in, in the organization, then which I'm involved in, in working with startups, but also big pharma and med tech companies. I would just maybe stop on the on, on that, let's say, relationship be between big all pharma right, and right. startups. Uh, I would say that, that uh, let's say, we, we offer a number of opportunities where startups can simply start talking to pharma. I think that's the basic uh, point. So... Uh, we are having more and more programs in, in Europe, but also globally, where, where startups are exposed to big pharma. Because if I mean, if you if you have your small company and you think that one of your business development pathways is, for instance, I know acquisition or licensing model with big pharma, probably trying to I mean catch somebody come back, catch somebody on LinkedIn or on conference probably would not work. So, uh, at least my experience is that you need, you need to really have let's say fully fledged or well-developed technology, the team and the leader that is reliable uh, for, for your pharma, big pharma partner. You need to also understand the internal landscape of big, big pharma. So, I mean, these organizations are quite complex. And uh, obviously, if you're looking from outside, you don't have, for instance, anybody uh, in your advisory board that has been previously working inside or with big pharma it's really hard to present your project in a way that you you, you might be able to uh, get an interest and last but not least what i what i also think is a crucial element for, for collaboration between big pharma and the startups that startups have to find an ambassador or sponsor you might call it um, whatever you want but uh, but i think that's that's quite important at least startups that i had a had a honor to work with and they were uh, looking at Big Pharma as a possible pathway for scaling their business. These were the critical, cr cr critical things. So to wrap up, a team and a leader that is, that is motivated, uh, has different skills and understands how to build your business, especially in life sciences, that's critically important to understand not only technology, but business, clinical validation pathway, but also regulatory pathways. Second, it's about uh, maturity of your solution so if you're not enough mature nobody in the big pharma will be willing to talk to you third element is really a deep understanding of how big pharma is working what are what are the internal let's say uh, uh relationship between different units that you're planning to to talk to and last but not least it's really uh, getting a sponsor or ambassador somebody who would be really uh, shouting about your project inside the organization and, and thanks, thanks to this you might be able to, to, to be successful. So that will be my first, let's say, hints to, 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 okay. uh, to this okay, panel. <clears throat> Thank you for opening the discussion and when we are talking about the starting point, maybe we shall present ourselves with our uh, also cooperation from the past. So maybe we should start from Kelly. Tell us about you. Who are you and what common have you with Big Pharma? So I'm Kelly Gray. Um, I work for AstraZeneca on their Open Innovation Programme, which is our externally facing uh, collaboration programme. 
so just to go back a, a few years, not too many, um, I started off in academia and I did my PhD and I stayed working in the university system for about eight years. And then in 2015, I um, secured a role at AstraZeneca as part of the safety organization. So working very much in the in the project uh, portfolio. Um, and then in 2019, I moved over to the Emerging Innovations team. And last year, I took on the role formerly of the Open Innovation Program Manager. And um, so, yeah, it's going to be a really interesting discussion, I think, because uh, the way I can possibly see how we interact with pharma is from both the academic and the big pharma side. So I'm, I'm really interested in the, the discussion later on. So I'll hand over to the next person. Okay, so I will go next then. Uh, welcome everyone, uh, Paweł Żołnierczyk. I do represent uh, in the early days uh, IP commercialization here in Manchester, Kelly saw around uh, former uh, AstraZeneca site uh, in uh, Marcusville, so basically in the Aldery Park. My first interaction with uh, Big Pharma, it was year more or less 2011, 2012, when I represented uh, one of the Polish medical university in the license deal with uh, one of the, the top five uh, pharma from US. Uh, and uh, interesting uh, was the fact that we were able to do not only licensing deal, but also joint development agreement. So it was a combination of, uh, of both R&D development and, uh, and straight uh, license. I understand that we can share uh, experience from certain events later on. Yes, that's, that's what, because I, I probably can, can tell a little bit more about that. But uh, very quickly later on, um, I spun out my first spin off, and uh, I had the privilege of working with uh, Alex Plivery. Um, Kelly, uh, I will mention a little bit more details because Alex Plivery was a head of the marketing and oncology for AstraZeneca in the 80s. Um, so uh, I've learned how Big Pharma is looking at the projects at the early stage from the end point. And uh, Mikoa, you mentioned end point. So I learned that for, for Big Pharma, Endpoint is actually drug on the market. Um, uh, then I moved into the R&D and I had the pleasure, actually privilege, working for years with uh, Dr. Gerard Costello, who was uh, uh, head of the uh, R&D oncology, global head of the R&D for, uh, for Astra. And we spent years working together on many projects. And that was that is actually uh, brilliant experience. Um, then I also uh, had the pleasure of working with the licensing uh, <laughs> director Alan Warren there again from Astra. So I kind of the, have experience of working with, the, with in this triangle between marketing, 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 uh, R and D, and licensing and uh, and partnering. So I see how things moving. What what is important, especially you know, for the compounds which are because that's what I do represent new therapeutics definitely for the compounds in the early stage. And the recently, um, uh, I've been working closely with a partner in the CNS. Uh, again, as a global partner on this occasion is, uh, is US partner looking for, uh, Kelly, a little bit uh, toward your area, is about basically speaking uh, scouting team uh, of the big pharma uh, in the CNS area. So my experience uh, definitely is good couple of surprises, a uh, couple of, uh, uh, I would say, un unexpected uh, comments from Big Pharma, what they want, what they want to see from the compounds at the early stage. Uh, uh, but I will leave it for later for the open discussion, I want uh, your opinion. Uh, overall, I think uh, uh, Big Pharma is corporate business, you need to appreciate that. Uh, it has own strategy. And it's very strict on uh, on the strategy, on the key uh, on the key interests. They are very well positioned, very well understood within the entire corporate business. Like Miko, I said, you need to have a champion uh, in uh, uh, in this organization because it's very easy to for your project to get lost somewhere if there is no champion. Uh, and uh, you need to know your compound, your technology very, very well. Not only why it does work, but also you know, surroundings. 
So, for example, to know that it does act on certain molecular target is not enough because uh, there will be always the question, okay, what is a possible side effects later on? So do you know the biology around your compound? Um, and I stop at, uh, at that and uh, yes, uh, Pavel, you, you want to go next? Okay, that's no problem. Okay, uh, I'm Paweł Szymański, I'm a scientist, uh, uh, live on universities uh, boring. This is why I uh, prepared a uh, spin-off company with my uh, friend Kamila Czarnecka. Uh, brand name of uh, our company is BQ B Quality. And the aim of uh, our uh, company is to increase the use of the university's potential cooperation with uh, industry in the field of, uh, of course, of research, design, development, training, and implementation of new products. Mm, the most uh, interesting project, what we do now, this uh, cooperation with uh, Devon company, uh, we prepared uh, design new biopsy needles with uh, uh, antibiotics, and we co prepared co-opting uh, these needles by uh, uh, film, biofilm with antibiotic. And now we prepared uh, uh, this needle to, to production and to, uh, from production we take to the validation processes and uh, uh, analysis of stability and uh, we prepared needles for clinical trials. And uh, I think that uh, Big Pharma is a good option for young startups because on the start, we, as a startups, uh, we need uh, contacts, cooperation with other companies because uh, the most important uh, in young company is this connection with other partners, especially in the first time when we start our, uh, our, 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 our work. I think this is, uh, it should be uh, we should meet uh, in this form uh, very often, not only one per year and, and so on. That's, Thank all you, right. Professor. That's why I am happy that we can uh, talk together in this form. So we started from Big Pharma, went to the man who is making project between get to the academia and get, going back to Mikołaj, who is something b above all of that. Okay, I, I don't want to say above, but uh, yeah, I should, uh, yeah, I, I probably I should introduce myself uh, during my previous intervention. So yeah, my name is Mikołaj Gurdawa. I'm, I'm based in Poland, in, in Łódź, uh, but for, for the last six years, I'm engaged with the EIT Health, which is the largest, largest uh, uh, public-private partnership in uh, healthcare innovation um, environment in Europe. So we cover more than 20 countries and we work with 150 organizations across Europe, uh, including academia, research organizations, healthcare providers, uh, large international um, companies, accelerators, hospitals, and incubators. Uh, previously, I have been uh, working for Medical University of Łódź as a, as a head of strategy uh, research and development office. So my role was to uh, build the strategy for the university, including uh, external uh, collaborations, international uh, affairs. So this is where I had the uh, privilege to work with Bartek and also with Pavel. So that, that's, that's a part of the history that, that brought me to, uh, to AT Health, where I work, as I said, on a daily basis with, with innovators and teams uh, from different uh, sectors of life sciences in building innovation projects, education uh, formats for, for citizens, patients, and healthcare uh, professionals, but also directly with the startups, help, helping them to, to scale and build, uh, build their uh, businesses. And my um, exposure to Big Pharma was, was naturally start, was started uh, when I was uh, working for the university. So with the, there were a number of projects that we have been let's say, developing, let's say, in, in, in Poland, but also outside. Uh, but, I mean, that increased significantly when I joined EIT Health. So I worked with a with number of companies on their projects in different uh, conditions, domains, and technologies. So these were not only, let's say, as EIT Health, we do not 
support of finance drug discovery projects. So we are somewhere on the borderline. So we, we work uh, strongly with the pharma on, on medical devices or digi digital technologies that, for instance, are supporting uh, drug uh, uh, discovery process, but, but it, they also support the um, uh, diagnostic uh, and uh, therapeutic and compliance processes. So I think that's, that's also quite interesting perspective. Uh, plus, recently, uh, I was, I'm engaged in a project with the um, Agency for Medical Research in Warsaw, together with AstraZeneca, Roche. I think AstraZeneca is somehow kind of um, recurring, uh, let's say, recurring topic today. Uh, so, as I, with AstraZeneca, with Roche, IQVIA, Microsoft, uh, and Pool Pharma, uh, within the initiative called Warsaw Health Innovation Hub. So, I'm also happy to, to, to tell you a bit more about how we uh, simply unleash the potential of large uh, pharmaceutical and uh, IT companies uh, within this hub and how this would, uh, let's say, I hope positively impact the quality of healthcare system in, in Poland, which is not always connected directly to drugs, uh, which I think is interesting for, for let's say, biotech or pharma-oriented uh, startups, but there are also another or a bunch of different technologies and solutions that patients and healthcare system in Poland is looking for, where the collaboration with Big Pharma is one of the ways to, to deliver those, those aims. So that will be all from my side. All right, all right. So we have found here that there is some cooperation for academia and Big Pharma as a viable thing. We have here good answers from the sentences before and also from the query before the meeting. You all have said that it is quite good. Mostly 75% of you said that is very interesting and, and it's possible. And I would like to ask you, especially Kelly, what exactly do you mean when you are saying that the big pharma is available for academia? Okay, so it's been really interesting hearing everyone's thoughts and that AstraZeneca is, is involved in lots of collaborations, which is really nice. So we started the Open Innovation Programme back in 2014 and it, it was really launched as a kind of compound sharing initiative. And um, academics could come to us and say, can we please have some of that compound to look at a preclinical study or a clinical study? And the majority of those assets were from terminated programmes where they didn't reach um, the endpoint on their primary indication. So it's just about really repositioning, repurposing, but trying to make the most out of what we had. But as the programs developed over the last six years, the offerings have broadened massively. So we're now offering live assets on the on the portal. We're offering data. We're offering um, preclinical and clinical ready assets. And we also do a lot of target identif identification by offering uh, the screening sets that we have. So up to 250,000 compounds. And then, so that's really um, focused toward academic collaborations. And I would say it's very much um, about academics coming to us with a hypothesis and asking whether they can have access to the various tools and expertise that we offer. But then last year, we came up with a, a kind of new idea because we realized that the startup community is, is really expanding and people are really developing great ideas and solutions to technologies and new modalities things that we want to move into, but we don't perhaps have the kind of bandwidth and resource to be able to do internally. So we're really looking to collaborate and partner. So we launched something called CoSolve, which was really focused towards being able to engage with startups to move very quickly on developing ideas and solutions for therapy area led problems. So what we did was we went to the therapy areas, cardiovascular, respiratory, and said, you know, what are your imminent challenges that you need solutions to in the here and now. They came forward with a list of challenges. We ran an eight week open call. And at the end of that, what we're looking to do is actually provide some funding towards a collaboration. So not just a fee-for-service, but actually you come with an idea, you own the idea, we work with you, we bring in AstraZeneca expertise, we bring in kind of the tools, the, the technologies that we have access to, and we drive the project forward in 12 to 18 months. So that's the premise behind CoSolve, and we've run two of those calls. And so one of the difficulties that we find is actually being able to access people. So we can put it on LinkedIn, we can you know, um, try and advertise through our networks, but we really need to find out what academics need, what startups need. And I think there was a comment about something has to be pretty well developed to actually um, 
get seen. But we also have horizon scanning groups and technology groups, and they're all looking for the next big thing very early on. So sometimes it's quite good to have that conversation. You can contact us through kind of the open innovation portal, and we then can disseminate the message to the various teams. And COSOL was a really great idea. And it meant that people could actually get access to internal AstraZeneca folks who were reviewing the proposals. So even if they didn't necessarily 100% align with the challenge, it raised a, a flag and said, oh, this is something that's really good that's happening externally. Maybe we could follow up in a different way aside from COSOL. So I think we, we've really broadened our offerings because we want to make the program as good as it can possibly be. And what we really do see is that the academic partners that we have are generating some really incredible science. And so by, by sharing the tools and expertise that we have, we can really impact the scientific community for the better. We really encourage publication and we can also kind of help with getting grant funding and et cetera. So I think from my perspective, if I'd known about open innovation when I was in academia, I could well have thought, or actually my, my project could really benefit from a pharmacological inhibitor or from something that has got a lot of the, the data attached to it and I could then try it in my model, um, but I didn't. And so now I do really do try and push the message that there's a lot of tools and technologies there and that not just AstraZeneca is sharing, pretty much mm -hmm. every big pharma has got an open innovation program. And I probably shouldn't say that because we don't want you to go elsewhere, but it is, you know, if you have a look around, people do want to work together. So I think that's a key message and something that even if you think your idea might not be the greatest, come to us. We can talk about it. We can bring in the scientists. We can really have a discussion about what benefits both parties. We want it to be an in-kind collaboration. We don't just want it to be transactional whereby you ask for something, we give it to you, you go on your way and we don't speak again. It's about a collaboration. So I'm going to stop because I talked a lot. So I'll let some Thank go. you, Kelly. That was very <laughs> interesting. It gives me the opportunity to ask professor as a startupper uh, about the next point, how the cooperation is available for startups. So we have heard right now that for academics quite open and it is not only the transaction, this is also about cooperation in larger and uh, longer period of time. I would like to ask you, professor, did you met something like this in your uh, experience? We need Hello. you to turn on the microphone. Still nothing? All right, yeah. Yes. It's now, it's working. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, of course, this is a cooperation with uh, uh, other uh, companies, other uh, academic uh, uh, points uh, for startups is uh, uh, difficult. It's easy when we are startup of university and then we can cooperate with uh, uh, separate departments uh, on our university. It's easy. Uh, it's easy to cooperate with uh, Center of Innovation because uh, this is uh, our uh, mother of our our, our startup. Uh, in uh, our case, uh, uh, because we we are part of this uh, university, but. Uh, mm, Big Pharma, I think, is a good uh, choice for, for us and for other startups because we need to find new, uh, new ideas. Uh, of course, we uh, provide uh, own, own projects and uh, uh, own laboratory, but uh, uh, you, you know that uh, one line of production, one line of product is not option for 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 a company for start of course this uh, fine because we have one product we try to sell this product we uh, try to improve this product to the market but uh, we are on the market uh, from four years and we know now that uh, we need uh, cooperation with other companies to develop and uh, this is why big pharma this chance for us and i think for other startups to develop uh, own ideas and, and, and uh, 
So I, I think this, uh, this. Uh, all right, all right, all right. Thank yeah. you, Professor. So, uh, us as NECA is as a big farm is open for startups and academia. You yeah. are presenting the point that startups need it, but not always is ready for it. Maybe we would like to ask Paweł Żołnierczyk what he has seen, because we would like to go deeper into the team of cooperation of big pharma with startups. Maybe some examples when the startups catch on or big pharma was interested in. Uh, okay, first disclaimer, uh, what I'm going to present is uh, my very subjective point of view based on my personal experience uh, working with academia, with the te certain technologies and with the certain individuals and the certain large, uh, large pharma uh, trends. So uh, from my perspective, uh, first of all, we need to understand that academia is a part of the same development process for the big pharma. So basically speaking, chemistry laboratories are pretty much, and they look the same, the R&D, the way R&D is uh, done in terms of the uh, working on the project is the same. Now, what I've seen many times is underestimation how how good and how excellent scientific quality is represented by big pharma uh, uh, individuals. These scientists are top notch. And uh, very often what I've seen in academia is this thinking about we do the science and uh, big pharma just selling drugs is, is not true. You, you will put yourself in, in the huge disadvantage if you approach collaboration with uh, or even first conversations uh, with, big, uh, with any partner from the commercial world. The difference is that, and again, that's my very personal view and you, know, you may not agree, but the difference is that in academia, we very often moving from one grant to another and we complete the grant, we, we uh, put a couple of publications, uh, we make sure that uh, we can, uh, mm, can kind of the report back, the financial section is good and that's, that's all, we're moving on. In, in Big Pharma, which operates as a business, uh, it does work differently. So basically speaking, the level of responsibility for the success of failure is different. It's much more personal almost. Therefore, people are far more stricter than you may anticipate. And they, the scientists tend to leave the, the, a little bit margin on the edges of their knowledge. And that is less acceptable for taking a decision which uh, technology move forward and invest 60, 20, 40, and later on hundreds of millions of, of dollars. This is a huge difference from the, uh, between, uh, between the parties. Then what I would like to mention is that what academia can bring to, um, to commercial partners, including Big Pharma, but it is, is this, the same applies for mid-level biotechs and even for the startups. Academia can bring good understanding of biology behind the uh, behind the technology. Again, in my case, is a new therapeutic area, so basically potential drugs. Uh, uh, what I've seen many times is that in academia we think that first efficacy results guaranteed that we can say we have a drug, okay, and then we approach partners and we say we have a new drug to cure uh, this, this, or another. Or for the, another therapeutic area. That's completely not true. Now, what we may have in academia is a candidate, and that's the best case scenario. If we want to increase the chances of, of success in this interaction, Kelly mentioned, uh, bring the biology with you, bring your good understanding, uh, do head to head experiment early on to show the superiority and be strict about uh, about the results uh, you you're generating now in terms of uh, more contractual relations what we're talking about is uh, collaboration between two organizations which are are relatively large corporate structures and they have their own specific uh, now in terms of expectations uh, uh, when big pharma is coming through the door everybody sees one million dollar upfront payment or that is unspoken anticipation. It's not going to happen. Definitely on the day one. Uh, it may happen later on. So what I'm trying to say is that Big Pharma will take a look on any compound or any technology from the investment perspective. 
how does it work that does it make any sense really to put 5 10 20 30 and hundreds millions of uh, uh, dollars euro uh, in all pounds in, in the case of astra uh, in in the particular technology because it is return on investment uh, business and i think final comment i would like to uh, i would like to make is a comment uh, uh, around the kind of the driving the program now better you prepare the higher the chances you will catch attention and uh, someone will champion your uh, your project internally you know big pharma is competing internally for the resources not only for the for the money and that could be controversial money is the easiest part really that's what i see that that's my personal experience money is the least problem the, the much more important is a is a time and people so when you have a program, when you present the program, you need to understand that your partner from Big Pharma will have to decide about assigning people to this program. It means that the people won't, won't work on another program. And we all uh, should appreciate that, especially in the new therapeutics, this is constant failure. Is more compounds dropping off along the, the way than make successful. Therefore, your partners from commercial entities including big pharma but the same applies for the mid uh, uh, mid-level uh, pharma around the world they will look from the risk management perspective so what are the signals which make this technology this compound less likely to fail before we start talking about oh, what fantastic success we will, we will get and the probably final comment is the size of the market for my, from my experience with uh, molecular diagnostics uh, deal, which was absolutely brilliant, we've done it in three months, the fastest ever, 25 iterations, very professional, absolutely brilliant. Uh, the threshold uh, was around $300 million. Uh, so basically technology should offer that kind of return to uh, a revenue stream on the annual basis. For the new therapeutics, it's much higher. It's probably at minimum 300 plus, and I would say you should be prepared uh, to, to prove that you can cut something a half billion dollar uh, annual sale on the peak, of course, uh, globally. Uh, well, these corporates are large and they need a feed family. Yeah? So the revenue stream should need to be significant. All right, Pavel, you have give us quite huge overview with some details. <laughs> um, I thank you for that. But I also would like to ask you what you have seen exactly, what kind of cooperation have you seen? What was the attractive point in the query before uh, you okay. all have said that competences of, of academia are very good and interesting for big pharma. Maybe you can say something about that. Yeah, absolutely, no problem. Uh, I think I can share experience from uh, molecular diagnostics in the non-small uh, lung cancer area, where scientists uh, in one of the medical universities in Poland propose new signature to diff differentiate the patients uh, with the higher likelihood of uh, recurrence from those who may not be treated uh, with the adjuvant therapy. And uh, Big Pharma, okay, I cannot disclose who, who is it, uh, sure. but Big Pharma found about uh, that technology on the scientific uh, uh, scientific event, on one of the big conferences. So that was the way where Scouts basically picked up. It did much nicely the need in the, uh, in the portfolio, and uh, we started to talk. And I was asked to represent university interest, simply. Uh, so I was uh, present on every single uh, meeting and uh, experience from first uh, first day was that guys from the big pharma are the real scientists and they ask hardcore questions about the science. So very quickly, scientists from academia realized that actually these guys not only have a fantastic CV and educations from one of the best universities around the world, but also they are practicing scientists. And they are not easy, there is not an easy way to go around, oh, we don't know a little bit here, or we are not sure about that, but it all will be fine. No, there is, so no, advice would be, be open about. Don't 
and they are pre these guys were prepared to understand incompleteness of the technology now as we move on it came to the realization that this technology requires next step and that's how we started to talk about joint development agreement but of course we, uh, question arise okay if things go well then what's the deal and i have to say that uh, uh, it is brilliant to have an engaged partner from big pharma now this is the first discrepancy i see uh, in academia, usually when you talk about the deal, you talk, you take scientists, maybe someone from tech transfer office and someone from the financial area of university to talk about the structure of the deal. And with the, with the full respect to these people, there is very little practical experience of, uh, of making these deals. How does it work? They, they very rarely been involved in development of the technology from the larger partner perspective. So they have kind of the expectations and lack of knowledge. It's an asymmetry of knowledge. That's what I would say. Partners from uh, from uh, Big Pharma usually come with the person who is skilled in the, in the area and with the commercial uh, manager, commercial negotiator. So you've got the champion, you've got someone who, who knows about the science, and someone who is responsible for the commercial dealings. And this is very professional team. It is, so do not underestimate that. And also I would suggest, uh, ask for the advices. They want this to happen. They spend time with you for this to happen, not to steal your program, absolutely. And the ethic in big pharma is much, much higher than we may imagine really. And sometimes, you know, there is, you know, the big pharma stealing things, etc., etc. Very rarely, okay? Again, that's very personal view. Um, now, what I've seen as a very mind-blowing, actually, situation was that we were working against the time. So Big Pharma has a budget every year, yeah? And it is, uh, can you please correct me if, uh, if I'm going too far uh, with the comments? And we had the three months uh, of, the, of the budget for the particular year, and then it would disappear, okay? So, we knew the money is there, uh, but we had to negotiate uh, joint development agreement and license. So our partners from Big Pharma were prepared for the three iterations a week, every week for the three months to, to, to strike a deal. There is a drive and it was, I would say, superb, excellent experience. Now, we thought that it will be all about uh, securing uh, IP, securing publication, securing the flow of information, securing the number in terms of the Mysons, you know, royalties level and an upfront payment. Uh, so we negotiated uh, throughout uh, uh, and around four days before the deadline, we had a deal. We had 60 pages document 20, 20 about joint development and around 30, 35 uh, straight license. So it's quite a piece of documentation. So we took it directly to university for the approval. And I got the call saying this deal is not going to go through, through the university. I said, Phew, why? I mean, the numbers are pretty handsome and, you know, the figures are very, very... Uh, well designed and uh, it's very very pro university so why not and the university said because we do not agree for the lower jurisdiction being different than uh, our university is positioned geographically so basically speaking university said that it must be law of poland and the ip and juris jurisdiction in certain uh, town in poland when we said that to our partners from uh, from Big Pharma, they said, no, it's not going to happen. I mean, there was that that was a deal breaker. And uh, uh, what Big Pharma said, OK, so why don't we go for the third party law and jurisdiction? And Kelly, on this occasion, I suggested, OK, let's go for the England, predominantly because English law and the philosophy uh, is uh, probably more toward academia 
where it is a deal with the big pharma that the courts in England recognize that academia is less experienced in the business, is not a commercial entity and may not have the knowledge and the experience which definitely sits with the com large commercial partner. So our uh, our colleagues from big pharma, this is absolutely fine, no problem. Uh, you know, England is reputable uh, in the in the area of IP, especially in the life science, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so absolutely fine. Uh, we took it to uh, we thought as a good news uh, to the university that uh, you know, partner from the commercial world agree to the comfortable or pro university uh, uh, legal environment, and this is still state. No, it, we want this to be governed by slightly underdeveloped IP. Uh, law in Poland and with the certain jurisdiction uh, in terms of the of the town. So we spent, I'm not joking, around 12 hours uh, running against the time. And finally, we convinced the university to, the university said to take a risk from the university perspective that was taking a risk because they were going outside the you know, comfort zone. Experience from that is you need to anticipate uh, surprises along the way and usually surprises will come from the area you least expect them now be open to the uh, to the partners from uh, from large pharma because they will find the things now the uh, ex experience negative experience again and this is a little bit toward academia is very often academics go over optimistic about what the technology can do and i've seen them, this myself in this deal when it was brilliant. Uh, our partners from from uh, industry ask, okay, so what is the threshold level you feel your uh, uh, your method uh, in terms of the power can predict? What is it? And the uh, academic said, oh, we are good. And they set up the threshold, I would say, too high. And they missed that threshold along the way, but one or two points. And the output is negative then. So before you, you go very optimistic, please, please, please be very realistic and rather conservative of what you can do. It's better to have a surprise uh, later on as a good surprise rather than, oh, well, but it's not bad, you know. I know we missed that point. I know there is no statistic, uh, statistical significance, but, you know, uh, it's still good, uh, uh, good uh, candidate. Overall, uh, there is a mismatch in terms of the expectations and uh, preparations for, the, uh, for structurizing the, the commercial, even research, uh, research focus uh, agreements. Uh, big Pharma is far more professional because they, they operate in the business. Academia is erratic. Some, you know, there is a deal and then five years late, later is the next one. So there is no constant. You know, skills and expertise development, uh, really. And right, so, my right. advice is be open about that. They will help. Okay. You. Okay, Pavel. Thanks to you. We have smoothly go to from the sufficient size into the break deal deal breaking parts of of cooperation. And maybe we also should ask about not the formal and legal thing, but also of the understanding of the partners in the projects. Maybe someone who have seen uh, quite few of them in whole Europe, like Mikoi, would tell us about the deal breaker, which is the understanding of sites. Yeah, thank you for that question. So let me start with, with uh, what, what Kelly was referring to. So I, I believe that uh, this understanding based on this, this challenge-based approach, I think is quite good. So I'm, I'm very rarely seeing or, or observing, you know, startup going with the technology to, to large pharma. It's, it's more like big pharma is getting more open to provide certain challenges in a specific, let's say, diseases or technologies or some, at least this is the way we do it in the IT health. It's somehow a hybrid solution. So you have a drug, but for instance, you want to increase a compliance. So somehow you want to engage patients more. And this is, I mean, a, a large let's say, ocean for the startups from digital health area. So, so I, I, I think this is, this is the way uh, of building this mutual understanding. And what, what Pavel was mentioning around all these different negotiations, I think that comes later, before you have to build the trust and understanding. So, so on one hand, 
at least we have a program called uh, Startups Meet uh, Big Pharma. And this is, I mean, that was a unique opportunity to work with uh, companies such as Amgen, Sanofi, Bayer, or Roche. And, and exactly as Kelly was, was, was uh, showcasing the, the Open Innovation Program at AstraZeneca, we asked those companies to bring the challenges. We offered them to, to get a, let's say, pre-selected list of startups in a specific domain, such as biotech, medtech, and digital health. And they can really go, let's say, visit those companies. They can, you know, establish a relationship and decide whether they want to go to the next stage that Pavel was, was describing. On the other hand, startups, and that's, I think, quite important. That, and, and I think, well, I'm sure that refers also to scientific teams or clinical teams. We also provide a constant training. And I think, Kelly, you have been also mentioning that. So, so we... we constantly train the teams how to talk to Big Pharma, how to prepare your value proposition, how to speak in a language that is based on yeah, revenue stream, what is your business model, etc., etc. So I think these are quite important elements that build an understanding. And, and I think Pavel mentioned a lot of elements. I don't want to, let's say, uh, repeat them, but maybe I'll just add a couple of ideas. So if you're starting such a serious project, be ready for the pivots. So you have to be ready that somebody, especially if you're talking to, let's say, inter interdisciplinary team at Pharma, where you have, I know, market access people, uh, scientists uh, working in a specific technology, they also have their medical advisory boards. You have to be ready for the pivots. So don't stick with your mind to the project, because for sure, during the negotiations, uh, once you're going to build the deal, for sure, that is going to be... Um, uh, that, that is going to be something that you have to uh, come up with. So another iteration of your project, pivoting certain, let's say, grounds or frameworks for the project. Uh, well, I, I, I want to be speaking about determination because this is normally a, a long-lasting process. Again, re repeating what Pavel said, really money is not the issue here. So, so I, I think I would first put the money aside. I would rather focus... If you're reliable enough, whether you have capacity in your team, in your project, to spend the money from Big Pharma in a proper way. And what Pavel was mentioning about how many patients you're going to reach, what kind of impact your solution is going to, to uh, generate on the market. What, for instance, are you know, patient reported outcome measures will be in your project. These are, I think, a key elements without which you, it will be really hard to convince a big pharma to engage with you in the project. And also about the understanding, which I think is still not, uh, I think uh, it's still on top potential when it comes to academia, especially in a, in a life science or mainly in a medical field. That a lot of researchers that are, let's say, within the medical schools, they're at the same time clinicians. And they're sitting, sitting deeply with the patients with the therapy and diagnostic processes, which is unavoidable source of information. And basically, this is where I would also looking at certain problems or needs that can be solved. And this is what Big Pharma is very much looking for. So as, as both Kelly and Pavel were mentioning, Big Pharma is focusing on solving problems using, let's say, technology, science through the business, let's say, approach. And if, you, if you're able to generate or prove that basically your solution is addressing a concrete uh, problem. You have identified who owns the problem, how big is the problem, and basically how this impacts your market access strategy. I think then, then basically probably 80% of your success is there. And I have seen many companies who have been failing because they, they were claiming they have fantastic technology. You can quickly Google it that there are you know, three Chinese startups working on exactly the same thing and their valuation is growing. That's one point. A second, uh, basically, the, the technology could basically solve every problem, for instance, in the oncology. So there was no targeted first uh, indication, first implementation that would really enable a first success. And obviously, some big, big uh, pharma companies would never start talking to you if you don't go at least for the, for the first uh, phase of clinical trials, because this is, this is the model. But I, I, I don't want to say it's a role. So we have programs in which we... we we are, let's say, also far, let's say, before that. So preclinical pre -clinical studies are also really interesting projects for, for Big Pharma. And the last thing I want to say, because I mentioned that before when, when Bartek gave me a, a chance to speak, about Warsaw Health Innovation Hub, which I believe is a quite 
interesting model because this is, a, 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 I think, a, a way different way of working between different stakeholders in the healthcare innovation system and big pharma. So uh, we have just launched the initiative. So this is just a couple of weeks. But I hope in a, by, by the end of October, we will be able to present the first call for the projects where we are absolutely open for startups, clinical teams, uh, research teams, academia, also patient organizations to come up with the solutions that are aiming to, to target very concrete, uh, let's say, hurdles of Polish um, healthcare system, such as lung cancer, uh, post-COVID, let's say, uh, landscape, uh, using big data, real-world data, uh, broad uh, implementation of value-based healthcare approach in, in delivery of healthcare services, but also using e-health as a, as a method of diagnostics and treatment in, in different diseases. So, uh, but, but here, basically, pharma is going to co-sponsor these projects, but uh, we are not going to focus on a concrete, let's say, technology, but really want to look at how these solutions will be impacting patients directly. So, how much we can use the potential of big pharma, large corporates having their R&D and uh, sales activity in Poland together with the public sector. And I think this is also something that, that I think also brings a lot of value when you're talking to big pharma. We managed to bring the Ministry of Health, uh, Agency for Medical Research, the, the, the um, uh, National uh, Health Fund, but also the Center for eHealth. So all the major stakeholders were that I hope will help us to, to leverage the solutions developed by startups so they can be accessible for the patients. Because in the end, I mean, it's about the patients. <clears throat> you're not, obviously, you're developing the technology to, to have publications, to generate revenues. That's, that's for sure. But in the end, it's about the patients. And if you're losing the patients out of your radar, basically, it's really hard to, to, to create the impact and build a sustainable business model. Thank you, Mikolai. Thank you for that uh, point of view. So we are coming to the end of the discussion. And on the end, I would like to go back to the benefits. Uh, Kelly said to me before the meeting that she see quite good scientific benefits for both sides. Uh, you can see that I'm summing up in the chat. So I would like to hear you, Kelly. And this is the last sentence that I need to summarize the uh, the meeting. So please tell us about the benefits for both sides, especially about those scientific, what Big Pharma is taking in and what taking out and for is good, what is good for academia? So I think there's there's really benefits on both sides. It's a win win, isn't it? By by working with the external community, we can we can develop the uh, science, the groundbreaking science that's going on and we can then bring that knowledge back into our internal programs and then develop some of our drug projects based on the mechanistic biology that's generated. But we can also offer to basic scientists some of the tools and technologies that they can't get access to in academia. So these are things, we have a great deal of data, molecules, expertise, technologies, and we can really work together to be able to bring that into the scientific studies that are going on in academia. And just, just to talk to Pavel's point where he said about um, being able to generate a startup, we also want to mentor people. So if you come with an idea early on and it's not, not fit for purpose as it is, we can really work with you to try and get that and tell you what we would need if we wanted to bring it into an internal project. What, what is, what's the preclinical data package? What would that look like? What would it look like to get to the uh, phase one trial? So really the bar is high I'm not going to lie if we wanted to bring say an open innovation collaboration back into the portfolio as a as a target or as a um, preclinical CDID the bar is very high what would make that external science preferential to the internal science that's going on and so by interacting with the teams and the and the scientists you can really find out what's needed so it's about it's about a two way discussion. Basically, you develop your science and make it fit for the patients and then we can work with you to get it where it needs to be. So ultimately, we can take it forward potentially as a partnership and, and bring it to the patients in, in five or 10 years. And it's also about thinking about we, we put a lot of time and effort into developing drug projects and they may or may not work for their primary indication, but there's also a lot of potential for them. So 
if it works for a primary indication, we're still looking for life cycle management opportunities, but we may not have the resource to be able to do that internally. You've got a fantastic preclinical model. You understand the biology. You take that compound, you put it into your model and you say, this is brilliant. This is a new indication for you. And we're like, well, that's that's, you know, saved us a bit of time in that area. And then we can work together to see whether we can license the data or whether we want to take it forward as a collaboration. And it's also more recently what we're looking for as well is kind of there's a lot of academics and clinicians that are taking patient samples and they're in freezers and they'll, you know, they don't have the, the resource to be able to analyze, analyze those data sets with multiomics and that kind of thing. So we could work together whereby you perhaps supply AstraZeneca with those patient derived samples with all the relevant consent, et cetera. We can analyze them, share the data back with you, have access to the data ourselves, and then we generate new data for the scientific community, which can then be used to really um, advance science. So I think it's a win-win for everyone working together. And hopefully the myth of pharma coming in and taking your ideas and your data is something that's that's going away, as Pavel said. We're, we're not here to take ideas. We really do want to work together for the benefit of patients. Thank you, Kelly. I believe that those meeting and your last sentence was very encouraging to start the cooperation. So to cooperate, we need to start somehow. And in the starting point, very important is to check yourself where you are and are you ready for the hard questions that during it it could uh, it, it could happen many good things for you we have examples that the cooperation is happening and it is possible you need to be uh, open for different point of view but also ready to develop and ready for long-term cooperation not short transactions and there are some uh, <laughs> deal breakers like formal things but they could be defeated when both sides are open for cooperation and main benefits is uh, main benefit from the cooperation is self development because uh, the money are only a tool to develop yourself and your solution and in long term you will have opportunity to cooperate with scientists scientists from different research organizations. Big Pharma is also a research organization. They have their own science. So the cooperation under good understanding of science and good papers uh, after great agreement will give you opportunity to, to make good and many of highly pointed papers. So uh, for me, after that meeting, I'm really would like to start the cooperation i regret regret that i'm not scientist but i will find some and push them up from my side the summary is set into the chat i see that magda would like to say something before we leave uh, i would like to thank you for your time and great uh, co conversation and great answers that you gave us actually i wanted to ask a question <laughs> But I see that you're closing the meeting, so I totally understand because uh, Miko and Pavel need to run. Uh, no, I was just wondering because, you know, you're talking uh, about really nice programs and uh, the, the, for cooperation, but what I s experienced uh, as a tech transfer officer uh, at some point, that it's difficult to start the conversation with Big Pharma to make them interest. So I wonder, for example, whether this program of uh, what Miko I mentioned, maybe this will help to start the conversation, you know, like, hey, I've got a really nice uh, my, mice model, mouse model, uh, would you be interested in? And uh, usually with those small projects, pharma is like, oh, come on, we are dealing here, we are, we are curing CNS uh, and oncology. And um, so I, I wonder what is this first step, rather? Uh, Magda, uh, very quickly, uh, is much easier than you may anticipate. And I'm not the big fan of uh, taking the raw compound and going to bio meeting Europe, US or whatever, because uh, that is not the, we are, I mean, very often you are not ready for this environment. Is it five minutes or 10 minutes uh, 
conversation, you have no experience in, in talking that language, uh, whereas a kind of the mixture of marketing and uh, and the rigorous uh, in science. But scientists have a completely different, and I, I believe e at least equally successful uh, way uh, in. It is your usual scientific uh, activity. So basically speaking, what if you if you're thinking reaching out to your commercial partner, what I would do, I would prepare very strong publications, series of publications, try to uh, publish in the high impact uh, journals, go uh, and present on the high profile conferences and start asking other other scientists on the conference do you know someone who could be interested and you will be surprised uh, how quickly you will find the first contact to your commercial partner via professor who is in the same field of science mm -hmm. so you impress him with your publication and he will say i i, I don't have a direct uh, links but my colleague actually done something with kelly in the open oh. innovation yeah. forum and th this is you know three four uh, conversations can, can i just add somewhere. one yeah and one sentence because i have to go because they're yeah, calling yeah. me i have to join another Sorry. event magda i i, I completely I fully agree with pavo i think this is far easier than we all think so mm -hmm. uh, just to add if you have your presentation and you have your first result just sign up for all different pitching competitions and just pitch your project. Get as many feedback as possible. As Kelly said, big pharma or experts, they love to mentor, they, they love to provide the feedback. I mean, maybe first presentations will be really hard, but yeah. I, I would just say, just go outside, leave your comfort zone and start pitching your project to the, the, to the people that, start, that are thinking not only with the science mind, but also with the business mind. And you will get much more feedback, for instance, how you can leverage or use your MICE model to be, let's say, to be implementing a very concrete therapy. And then you're, ma you're maturing your project and with the next, let's say, iteration, you will be much better prepared for the questions and potentially you might find a partner. So, and sorry guys, I, I really need to yeah, go. I also have to so go. Okay. enjoy your day. And so thank you everyone. Sorry, one, one, one sentence, one, one thing uh, about the Big Pharma uh, from university side. Uh, we know too little about Big Pharma. We need more information about Big Pharma at universities because when we we're talking about this project, this uh, platform, then we start talking together. Now it was the first time when I uh, saw Big Pharma as a as a name. Uh, we talk uh, talked with uh, Bartwomi about about this this what is big pharma because uh, for me it was the first time when I heard about this platform. I think we should send more information to other universities, academias, and so on, and then it will be possibly possibility to cooperate together, not only between Big Pharma and uh, as, a, as a platform with university, but uh, with startups too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that is, that is a really good point. And we, we do try and kind of publicize the program, but that's one of the th key points um, about what we would need is to understand what actually scientists need. So we've got lots of resources that we don't share, but if they were something that people could use, you can always come to us and ask whether that is available and we can work through the organization. And one other thing, just to the point about um, we wouldn't be interested in mouse models or we have through the Open Innovation Programme, we have a contact form. Everything that you put into there is an inbox that's monitored by me. So this is only AstraZeneca. I can't speak for everyone else, but that's monitored by me. And when I get those, I read through them and I disseminate them to the relevant folks within the organization. So it's not a dead end. Once you click submit on that, Form, it doesn't go nowhere it does go to a real person and we're interested in everything and you know it'll get filtered out it may be that you get a no sorry we're not interested at this time but it's the first form of communication and just one really quick message because I know everyone's got to go but just for the startups um, a catalyst network um, is the big kind of uh, commercial organization uh, late stage for uh, AstraZeneca and they're actually setting up a portal for startups to submit their ideas so that will go live and you'll be able to get in touch and all of the kind of startup proposals will be reviewed reviewed and it's a and we obviously cooperate with slush now as well 
So um, it will be a really good way to access the organisation and get your technology reviewed and looked at by people in different areas of, of the R&D or the commercial organisation. So that's just one additional point there. But yeah, I would say just just reach out, you know, try lots of different people. Someone will answer your email in the end and then you can start a conversation. So don't don't be shy is the, is the message. <laughs> And, and you promised that for every filling in uh, the open innovation form, uh, forms, uh, we will get a reply. reply. I monitor the inbox. <laughs> so yes, I do try and reply and I chase up people. And yeah, yeah. so um, I would say that that is a really good way to get into contact with the with the inner yeah. workers of the organization. On my side, I must say that uh, I personally, I, I heard a lot about this open innovation uh, platform. So the, the, you are seen. It's just a matter of like going to uh, conferences, just like Pablo said, like going to, uh, going to conferences and uh, talking to people. Definitely, yes. Yeah. Uh, I see how much this networking is. Uh, doing good and uh, is uh, paying off Excellent. for sure. Um, Bartomi, can you tell us something about the survey? Yeah, we came up to the end and on the end uh, we would like to ask our audience who they would like to meet after it. So all summaries were set into the chat, but maybe you would like to have deeper contact. So we see that from our 14 participants, one would like to meet Kelly and two hey. Pablo. Uh, it's changing, it's changing, still changing. These votes. Just please please vote. don't, don't press the end voting button. Uh, <laughs> but uh, well, um, I think it's always uh, valuable to, to organize uh, meetings and uh, webinars and uh, currently webinars mostly but uh, to to spread the information uh, because even though uh, each university has a tech transfer office we see that there is still need to go deeper and deeper so um, I'm very grateful, Kelly, that, that you had time and uh, all the speakers uh, to participate in, in, in another meeting and another meeting. No, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's been really great to, to talk to you guys and to listen to the various insights of the other panelists as well. So it's been really useful for me. Good, good, good. Great. Um, uh, so I would like to thank you, Bartomi, as well, uh, for uh, leading the discussion uh, for the presenters and attendees. Um, I would like to invite you to tomorrow last meeting of the Biotech Week. And tomorrow's meeting is going to be exceptional because it's going to be real life. <laughs> 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 that we miss so much. Uh, it's being it, uh, it's going to be held in Warsaw, and it's uh, we we'll have a very interesting discussion on the problems around recruitment of uh, scientific talents, uh, about the problems with obtaining a specialistic uh, workforce for biotech companies versus IT company. So I think it will be very, very interesting uh, as because as I speak to many, and there will be AstraZeneca again. <laughs> We're everywhere. <laughs> yeah. uh, you open the cupboard. <laughs> oh, that's an AstraZeneca. <laughs> yeah, in a pill. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> So, uh, feel invited to join us tomorrow for the panel session and a glass of wine to ta -da, finish the, the week, uh, almost. Uh, and uh, thank you very much again for your presence and uh, I hope to uh, see you and to keep in touch uh, through uh, various meetings. So Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very Thank much. You. And see you by some contract. <laughs> <Yeah>. Signing. <laughs>